I'm gonna be honest, I am not a fan of modern military shooters. I feel like I need cans of monsters strewn across my floor and at least three holes in my drywall to properly enjoy them. But seriously, when you look at my experience with a franchise as beloved as Call of Duty, it's only with Black Ops 4, which I stopped playing the minute that I found out it didn't have a campaign. I'm told it's the worst one. So modern military shooters just aren't my vibe, but strangely enough, the game that has been at the top of my must playlist for many years has been Spec Ops The Line. I recently played it for the first time, and it was fantastic. Outside of the fun gameplay and the cool world, it sets itself apart from every other shooter out there. Not because of its gameplay or through its world, but because of its representation of trauma and how it ultimately becomes a critique of the shooter game genre as a whole. Welcome everybody to Try and Maiden, my name is Tryon, and if you like what you see, you should like and subscribe. Now I want to make something very clear, this is not a review of Spec Ops. Actually, if you want to see that, $1 a month I do extra vids, and today's is a review of the game, so if you're interested, consider becoming a channel member as it helps out a ton. Self-promotion aside, this video is not really looking at what Spec Ops The Line is, it's more so an analysis of what Spec Ops The Line does. I'm gonna divide this video into three sections, a summary of the game's narrative, how it represents trauma, and how it critiques the shooter game genre as a whole. Let's start with a recap of the game's narrative. I do want to say, even though you can't buy this game on Steam anymore, I'm still gonna issue a huge spoiler warning here. I will be talking about everything. The game opens on a hell helicopter chase. We don't know who we are or where we're going, all we know is that we're going down. As we narrowly escape the oncoming enemies, our helicopter crashes, cutting to black. We flash back to a few days earlier, where we see a fall in Dubai which has been ravaged by natural disasters. The US general stationed in Dubai, a General John Conrad, has issued a distress signal calling for an evacuation of the city. That call is answered by Delta Force, made up of soldiers Walker, Adams, and Lugo. Our protagonist is Captain Walker, the leader of Delta Force. Their current objective is to link up with Conrad's 33rd Battalion, who we are told is made up of heroes. Over the course of a few missions, we discovered that the 33rd has split in two, with some fighting for the health of the city, while others are committing atrocities in its streets. Alongside Delta Force, the CIA are mounting their own evacuation of Dubai, using insurgents as an army. Delta Force changes their mission to find Conrad, and they believe that the mysterious radio man, a journalist who's speaking for the 33rd, is their key to finding him. But before they can track down the radio man, they hear a broadcast of a CIA agent getting tortured, and they decide to intervene. To their surprise, the agent was already dead, set up as a trap for another CIA agent, Gould. Before they get captured by the 33rd, Gould bails Delta out, promising to help them on their mission to find Conrad. Delta escapes and soon discovers Gould captured, with 33rd soldiers threatening to kill civilians if he doesn't talk. Here, the player is presented with their first choice, save Gould or save the civilians. In my playthrough, I chose to save Gould, however, in the chaos, Gould gets killed, and so do the civilians. Afterwards, Delta comes across the Gate, a central 33rd base. The player is presented with another choice here, fight the 33rd head on or use white phosphorus to wipe them all out. I tried to fight the soldiers head on, but soldiers would continually respawn. So with no other choice, I used the phosphorus. After the carnage, Delta walks down, discovering that the gate was being used as a refugee camp by the good side of the 33rd, and the refugees who were being held at this camp are now all dead. This is one of the most harrowing scenes that I've ever experienced in anything. It's truly horrible. Stopped in his tracks, Walker leads his men forward, blaming Conrad for the atrocities that have been committed in Dubai. Walker finds a radio which he uses to communicate with Conrad, who decides to give him a test. We're given a choice between two prisoners, either execute a man who stole water for his family, or execute the soldier that killed that man's family. I chose the soldier, and we moved on. Delta then meets a CIA agent named Riggs, who asks them for their help securing the city's last water supply. Delta agrees and captures it. However, on the escort mission, the 33rd attacks the trucks carrying the water, which Riggs purposefully crashes. Crushed under the truck, Riggs reveals that he crashed it to cover up the 33rd's actions in the region for fear of declaration of war. The player is then presented with yet another choice. You can put Riggs out of his misery or leave him to die and I chose the former. Delta then makes their way towards the radio man, but on the way, Walker begins to hallucinate some very strange things. When they finally reach the radio man, they take him out and they call for the city to be evacuated. Delta destroys the radio man's tower and escapes in a helicopter, taking us back to the beginning of the game. And a really interesting detail that I like is that it seems like we also take Walker back to the beginning of the game? He says that he remembers it, which is weird because chronologically, this is the first time this happens. All that aside, after the helicopter crashes and in one of the coolest visual sequences that I have ever seen in a video game, Walker hallucinates Conrad blaming him for everything that he's done over the last few days. 
the imagery is so striking. I, it's so cool looking. I love it. Walker and Adams meet back up, but Lugo is nowhere to be found. Suddenly, he radios in asking for help, and Walker and Adams hurry over, but they're too late. Lugo is being hanged by Dubai citizens and is killed. Filled with rage, the player is presented with another choice. You can either kill the civilians who killed Lugo, or beat them back and make them run away. I chose to beat them back, and Adams questions our decision, asking if we still really want to save these people. Walker and Adams move on, finally making it to Conrad's base of operations. And it's here where Walker's hallucinations begin to ramp up hard, and eventually, Conrad forces Delta to surrender. Walker begins to comply, but Adams refuses, sending Walker away and sacrificing himself to cover his escape. Walker, beaten and bloodied, enters Conrad's penthouse, where we finally meet him face to face. However, during their conversation, Walker finds Conrad's rotting corpse on the penthouse balcony. Conrad had committed before the events of the game even started. Every single conversation that you've had with him over the last few hours, ever since the white phosphorus scene, has all been in Walker's head. And this is where the game splits into four different endings, but I'm only gonna cover the one that I chose for the sake of time. Walker confronts Conrad's hallucination, who tries to goad him into taking his own life. Walker refuses and takes down Conrad's hallucination. As Conrad leaves Walker's head, he says that it takes a strong man to deny what's in front of him. We then cut to a few days later, where a regiment of US Army soldiers come to pick Walker up. Walker comes across as a hostile at first, but ultimately surrenders. And after everything he experienced, Walker gets escorted out of Dubai, a very different man than the one who entered. And that's the story. Really fun, right? So if I were to break this story down into its absolute essential idea, it would be a story about one man's mental and behavioral deconstruction due to trauma. Trauma regarding military events is often umbrellaed under the term PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder, which is what I don't think we're seeing here. Now, I am not a mental health expert in any sense of the word, so forgive me if I get anything wrong. Also, mental health is no joke. So even though I'm only gonna really be focusing on trauma from this game's perspective and the narrative that we see, I understand that this is something that's very real and happens to very real people. And I just want to encourage you that if you're going through that or if you know someone that's going through that, getting help or offering it to those who may need it really makes a huge difference. And I would really encourage you to do that if you haven't already. The National Institute of Mental Health defines PTSD as, quote, a disorder that develops in some people who have experienced a shocking, scary, or dangerous event. Their list of symptoms includes flashbacks, recurring memories or dreams, distressing thoughts, and physical signs of stress. Now, that definition and those symptoms line up with what Walker experiences in this game. I mean, pretty much to a T. But there's one thing about the whole PTSD thing that puts a hole in that theory. The P. Post. That same article says that symptoms usually show up in patients around three months after the initial event. But in Spec Ops The Line, Walker's symptoms show up pretty much immediately. Now, is it likely that Captain Walker, with his prior military experience, already went through something traumatic enough to leave a lasting mental scar? Yes, but we're not clued into what that experience might have been. So, I think that what we're actually seeing is something closer to combat stress reaction, more commonly known as CSR. Health.mil defines CSR as, quote, a behavioral reaction or psychological injury of service members who have been exposed to stressful or traumatic events. They list symptoms such as extreme agitation, hyper-alertness, poor judgment, and feelings of unreality. And we also see Captain Walker go through every one of these symptoms. He gets angrier and less tactical as the game goes on, with his callouts reflecting that. Target neutralized! Ah! Kill his Walker continually makes worse and worse decisions as the game goes on, and his hallucinations do indicate that feeling of unreality. Now, all this to say, the events that cause Walker to go through this are similar things that happen to many shooter game protagonists, but the main thing that sets this game apart is that none of its peers covered the stress and mental anguish that comes with war. And to me, that turns Spec Ops The Line into not only a shooter game, but a critique of its own genre. As I mentioned earlier, Spec Ops was released in 2012, at the height of the shooter game craze. In the same year, Call of Duty Black Ops 2 was released, and I think that's pretty much the cultural peak of COD. So with years being defined by these modern military shooters, it was the perfect time for a critique of their morality to be released. Spec Ops The Line calls into question the ethics of shooter games, providing a truer representation of the horror found in real war. The coolest thing that this game decides to explore when covering this is your morality, the player. I mentioned this in the recap of the story, but whenever you're given the choice to do something, no matter what you decide to do, the outcome is always the worst possible ending. Whether you save Gould or save the civilians, 
both die no matter what. Try to not use the white phosphorus, the game makes it impossible to avoid it. If you spare Riggs or if you put him out of his misery, he still dies either way. In the best way possible, you're given the illusion of choice, a chance to do the right thing only for your decision to create something ultimately worse. It changes the way you think about your actions whenever you're playing video games in general. I know that at least in most shooters, it's super easy to zone out and not think about what you're doing. I mean, you rack up hundreds of kills without a second thought. And in Spec Ops, you're doing the same thing, but you're constantly reminded that the people that you're killing are real, and the person who's doing the killing is real. They have families, they have lives. In Spec Ops, there isn't a definitive good guy or bad guy, just gray moralities that lead to death and destruction. You're reminded of the harsh reality of war through a fake one. It's unbelievably impressive, and especially ballsy for it to release when it did. A shooter game that makes you think is such a unique thing, and honestly, it probably ruined any chance of me enjoying any Call of Duty campaign, because this is what I'm going to be thinking about the entire time. Spec Ops The Line creates a truly unique gaming experience that nothing has ever come close to in years since. Sadly, this game was a commercial failure, and the multiplayer was, as the professionals say, whack. Many reviewers said that the game failed to innovate in anything apart from its narrative, and I wish that were a false claim. However, that narrative alone should be enough to cement Spec Ops The Line in the annals of video games. Truly one of those gaming experiences that I'll cherish and have nightmares over for the rest of my life. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for watching. This has been Tryin' Maiden, I've been Tryin', and I'll see y'all next time. Peace!